Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 100th New Social Environment. My name is Catherine, and I have the absolute pleasure of being your MC today for a conversation between Hugh Hayden and Dr. Julie Reese. We're also thrilled to have the poet Judah Rubin here, who will read to close today's program. We'd also like to thank Dermot Company for supporting this week of the new social environment. You can learn about them and the Rails curatorial project with them from 2016 through the links in the chat, which I will post later. And now to introduce today's host. Dr. Julie Reese is an art historian who directs a master's program at Christie's Education. She has presented papers and chaired panels on issues related to art and environmental crisis at conferences, including the College Art Association and the Conference for the Council for European Studies. She's the author from Margin to Center, The Spaces of Installation Art, and she is the editor of Art Theory and Practice and the Anthropocene. Um, Julie, off to you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, it's, I'm very happy to be here today on the, the 100th uh, New Social Environment. I don't think any of us thought when this started that we would be here 100 days later. And I think it's one of the things that's kept a lot of people going. I know it's helped kept me going. And I'm really excited to be here uh, with Hugh Hayden, uh, an artist whose work I'm just getting to know. And I've spent the last few days immersed in it and I probably have <laughs> way too much to try to pack into this time but I will let Hugh do most of the talking. Uh, I'd like to introduce him. Uh, he, Hugh Hayden was born in Dallas, Texas. He lives and works in New York City. Uh, he holds an MFA from Columbia University and a Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell University. Wood has been his primary medium but in all of his work he's been exploring culture and mainstream narratives through familiar objects often made unfamiliar. And those objects ask the viewer to confront what lies beneath the surface if we look hard enough. Uh, just briefly, his work was the subject of a solo exhibition at White Columns in New York in 2018. And his work has been included in numerous group exhibitions. I'll just name a few. Tanya Banachter Gallery, PPOW Gallery, Gavin Brown Enterprise, Postmasters, MoMA PS1, Socrates uh, Sculpture Park, um, he did a residence at Glen Finish in Dufftown, Scotland, and we'll be talking more about that in 2014. Um, and earlier this year, his site-specific exhibition, Creation Myths, was at the Princeton University Art Museum's Bainbridge Galleries. Uh, he currently has a pop-up show going up at the Leeson Gallery in New York uh, this month. So it's actually a wonderful time to take him away from that installation to talk about some of the work that he's been doing. So Hugh, welcome. Hi. Um, I thought that, you know, we would start when I first began looking at your work, you know, I saw a lot of wood and we're going to talk about wood and what wood can mean and materials and process. But one of the statements that uh, Hugh made early on that I really took to heart was that although, as we'll see, much of his work deals with wood and salvaged wood, uh, it's not art per se, about uh, the environmental crisis. He's not the poster child for Greenpeace. Uh, Hugh's environment is also a social environment. In some ways, it's the suburbs more than the wilds. It's an occupied country. And I think one of the best ways to introduce his themes and his perspective on cultural narratives is to watch a few minutes of the film that you made when you were doing the residence in Scotland, a film called Hugh the Hunter. So if it's okay with you, why don't we begin with that and then begin talking once people have had a chance to see it? Sounds okay. great. So let's do that. Nick, can we have just a minute and a half of this very cool movie? It was at the pond on the edge of the marsh that he found his second prey. A foreign species that men like Hugh had bred for their own sport. Could he, a mere man, ever master the art of deception that came so easily to these creatures? Or did it even matter?
How strange, he thought, to be an animal that sought always to blend in. Thanks, Nick. And I think that's a great still to, uh, to leave up while we talk. So Hugh, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the genesis of the film when you got the residency. Were you already thinking about the narrative, the cultural narratives that Scotland tells about itself? Its tweeds, its moors covered in heather, its hunting traditions, uh, or did the, uh, the way this worked out, did it come later from actually being in that environment? Uh, yeah, when I uh, first uh, sort of won the residency, I, I had already had like a growing interest in a notions or ideal, ideas of camouflage as, and a relationship or connection to the environment and this idea of often in a lot of my works that deal with cam camouflage, there was this idea of um, this consciousness of assimilation in, into society in terms of you know, one's ability to blend in was like this like metaphor for some cultural assimilation. So I, I kind of went there with that idea already uh, in my work. And then, then I looked at this notions of like estate tweeds and tartans as this like, you know, uh, relationship to the landscape and this idea of, um, you know, uh, tweeds started off as being fabrics that were dyed from local uh, plants and flowers. And that um, at one point in time, when you traveled to a certain area, people knew you came from this the different place because those color flowers didn't grow where, where they were. And that sort of like as, you know, technologies became more sophisticated and more complex, like uh, the colors and like you know, the sort of weavings of, of fabrics could set, say where someone came from, from this sort of geographical lens of what was the local landscape. So I, I was really into, into this idea that a tartan, you know, at some point in time actually was a reflection of the plants that grew around the place where someone came from as this sort of idea of a connection, like a social connection to the landscape. Um. No, I, th I think that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. And again, your own connection to landscape, I think, is very much uh, through that that social lens. Can we go to the to the close up the the next slide so we can see the uh, the the jacket here, cherry bark on Burberry coat, and also on this idea of a kind of deception or camouflage, peacock feathers on canvas, looking like uh, a piece of wood one material sort of standing for another or uh, becoming another. I mean, I think this extends this, uh, your idea uh, of camouflage, but I wonder if you could say a little bit more uh, about that, about how that sort of makes the leap from, from nature to culture. Um, yeah, with, with the Burberry coat, you know, there's different um, ideas about sort of having the right clothes to fit into like a certain environment, whether it's a workplace or a social place that, you know, or even like that a business person or a lawyer is supposed to wear a suit or, or like how a woman should dress or how a tech CEO should dress, um, like say Steve, Steve Jobs or sort of, sort of like these different sort of ways that uh, uniforms exist and and like thinking about those as a form of camouflage or or, or like a you know to fit into a certain role um, or even a material possession um, we're, we're similarly with a with the peacock feathers on this log 
or like, you know, sort of trying to create the appearance of this like decomposing uh, log. Uh, I always I always felt that if you Google image search a peacock, most of the images of it are of it in a like, uh, how to say like man-made environment. There's like cut grass or there's like a fence or concrete in the image. And that I, I feel like in Western culture, a peacock is always thought of this like flamboyant, exotic thing when it when it's actually you know a balance of like evolution that in its natural environment it is relatively camouflaged this sort of balance of like you know s surviving but also like procreating and, and like continuing um so it's not as like ostentatious or in, as in flamboyant as it may seem when it's taken out of its context so i, I was always interested in like again, these ideas of survival and blending in and, and choosing when and where to stand out. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's, very, uh, it's very intriguing to me that uh, you can mine nature for things that human beings are kind of walking around doing with maybe not even thinking of them as having a connection to the way nature operates and the different uh, pieces of, of nature relate to each other. Uh, so I, I think that that connection uh, is a, a different approach to, uh, to looking at nature right now as an artist. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot in, uh, I mean, my own work and in, in previous sessions and other uh, discussions I've had with artists of, you know, how to find a connection to nature, how to reconnect to nature. And I think what, uh, what you're able to do is find these functions that are happening in nature and relate them to the way we may unwittingly be functioning in a very parallel way in our so-called separate uh, cultural realm. And I think that's really interesting. Uh, can we go to the next one? Let's see where we are. Uh, here too, uh, Zelig. Okay, I love this because it reminded me of the Woody Allen movie where he's this chameleon. I thought that was really, really funny. Uh, but again, uh, something looking like something else, something wearing something else, one material uh, becoming uh, another. I thought that was, um, that was pretty cool. Um, but if you don't mind, let's go on because I, I also want to make sure to get to Okay, here we go. These, this series, I really thought this was so uh, spot on. Um, yeah, we, when Hugh and I, when we were just talking the other day, we talked a little bit about what the word vernacular means. And if that's a word that we could kind of bring in here and, and think about for your work. So after we got off the call, I went and looked it up and I looked up all the synonyms for vernacular. And I found things like common, local, natural, ordinary, vulgar, indigenous. And I actually thought these were all really perfect for what you're looking at here, because uh, we're looking at a kind of um, you know, American vernacular in these forms. Uh, we're gonna look in a few minutes at a picnic table. You're looking here, obviously, at an Adirondack chair. Uh, kind of an uh, American vernacular, even a kind of Americana. Uh, and this idea that what is, is natural, and we don't think of it anymore as being any kind of um, a social category, because it just seems natural. It just seems part of the culture. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you selected the things that you have subjected to the Jones treatment. Yeah, I mean, they were all some level of ubiquitous at some point. And also, municipal isn't the right word or civic, but there was a level of um, specific well, these were also like, mo like modes of outdoor furniture and so they're like an Adirondack chair, I mean area where it's sort of, or it's this exertion of someone's ownership of the landscape or like a second home or this, this as what Trump recently called like a suburban lifestyle dream, uh, not versus an American dream, but there's this I idea of like land ownership specifically with it, an Adirondack chair and this as well as this idea this this idea of being able to exert like your your like leisurely exert your ownership of something um, as well as with the picnic tables they're also a more, like a democratic gesture 
of inhabiting a public like outdoor space that's meant for everyone. Um, but at the same time, they're both like very difficult uh, spaces to inhabit. Uh, with the Adirondack chair, uh, you know, you can't sit down at all and it's sort of this phallic shape so that, you know, there's different reasons to look at why this is an uninhabitable chair. I mean, uh, as an artist, it's a little open-ended, like who is, what is it saying or like, but, it, but it, any way around it, it's like this, this space that cannot be inhabited. Can we go to the Jones number two? Just let's go, go one forward. Okay, here's the, uh, one of several sculptures in which you have brought in the picnic table. Uh, which I also, in just looking at these symbols, it turns out the Adirondack chair and the picnic table were both invented in 1903. So they actually date from this same moment where uh, I think people are looking uh, very much what you say, the Adirondack chair is a way to enjoy your property. We might think of a much earlier analogy in art history, like uh, Thomas Gainsborough's Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, where Mr. and Mrs. Andrews are just standing there with all these fields around them. It looks like they're in a park, but basically it's a painting about their land and how they have this ownership over it. And so the, the Adirondack chair is uninhabited. There's no one sitting in it. But we get the idea that, um, again, in terms of accessibility. And the picnic table, it turns out, is also, you know, it's a fraught cultural symbol because it allows a kind of... Um, taking over of a wild space, but it was meant to contain people in that space. It's come under fire because people with disabilities, people in wheelchairs cannot access it. So it has its own uh, complicated history of accessible, not accessible, um, imposing on nature and allowing people to uh, engage with nature. Let's just take a moment and look at, uh, I want everyone to be aware of how you make these things. Because at first glance, it might appear that Hugh takes a picnic table and then attaches things to it. But these are, in fact, growing right out of. This, this is all the same piece of wood. Could you talk about that? Because this is actually, I think, really significant in how you go about making these things. Yeah, like uh, speci uh, specifically on this table, uh, I mean, the what was a branch is actually uh, what is here more at the scale of a stump because this this came from like very big trees like uh, this the photo the image on the left is when it was on a, in an exhibition at uh, Inwood Hill Park uh, in northern Manhattan but you for a scale you can see the trees the London plane trees in the background and that the where you see these sort of stumps coming out of the planks or the boards of the table, it's essentially you can imagine them having being cut out of that tree, the trees behind it, where just the tree, um, you know, getting a straight board, but leaving where the branch was leaving this sort of two foot long sort of base to it. Um, it was sort of this idea of like the wood itself these like stumps or these different appendages are integral. There's just essentially branches that have been sculpted or carved away at, so that it there's no like smoke and mirrors, but it's uh, um, just sort of you could. Com I sometimes like compare my the woodwork like this is uh, it's sort of like a chicken that still has the bones in it versus like say like chicken strips that are sort of more abstracted from the source of wood. Uh, so there's this idea of like where they come from and their connection to like a larger, greater landscape. I think that's a fantastic analogy. And most people prepare, prefer their chicken without a bone and no skin, looking like some mysterious substance that appeared in the package. And this again, that nature culture, it's like the, the nature sort of struggling to get out. Uh, and it's this idea of taking something that's very familiar, making it somehow uncanny and uncomfortable. Um, and you know, and also just using humor. I mean, I think that one of the things that I find really uh, effective about your work is that you're not afraid to have the humor be part of it. Can we get the next one? Next, yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, the Jones part three. So uh, here again, branches coming directly out. So that fence, which is all about claiming land, uh, fence from defense, right? Fence from defending and making a boundary. 
uh, here again a reminder of um, of the actual wild uh, source of that, but also a fence about accessibility. And I think that in choosing these structural American vernacular forms, uh, you, you get at the issues of accessibility uh, in a way that's very accessible. You know, I think that that's a, a very, you know, at a time where we're looking at a lot of socially engaged art and we're looking at a lot of activist art, um, there's a visual punning here that is, um, it's, it's very, it's very evident, but it's, I think it's done in a way that, um, that, that makes it very uh, accessible. So I, I thought those were, were pretty um, interesting. I mean, do you see this work, like for example, the, the three Jones pieces uh, as having uh, a, a deliberately socially engaged subtext? I mean, is that a fair way to be looking at it or is it, is it well, over reading? I mean, the, well, they're all three like the, uh, like the picket fence or the picnic table or the Adirondack chair. They're often like these things that are have a, a public life. Uh, so they're definitely, they come from like some idea, some relation, like relationship to society or a social space. Um, so they, they definitely have like a social aspect to them. And like with, with the, the fence, he, this, this piece here is, you know, a picket fence, it, uh, like the whole nature of it, it, like almost like an Adirondack chair is that most of picket fences are not over three feet tall. They're like, they're also like 50% transparent, typically on a front yard. So there, there are these, these things that it's not really meant to keep anyone out, but it's meant more so to show like your territory, similar mm -hmm. to this, in this idea of ownership, land ownership. So there's definitely this idea of like, look, but don't touch and, and this is mine and sort of part of that American dream. Uh, but also I would say with this one, it, the uh, now I'm forget the rail is actually um, it actually is a railroad uh, iron uh, uh, track and in, in terms of um, and this idea of like a red line this is made of, made out of red cedar the type of wood and the idea of like the creation of boundaries uh, you know through like redlining per se and, and like and sort of the use of railroads to do that or other sort of more urban gestures. So there's definitely like a, and again, making like, you know, this competitive uh, sort of thing that is sort of on the offense. Oh, I think I actually had missed that that was, um, that that was a, a railroad there. And I, and, but yes, the, the reddish cedar, I mean, absolutely. The idea of, of making home ownership impossible in a society that is structured around systemic racism and home ownership and lack of accessibility being one major, major part of that. Um, and I think, you know, there, there's that. And then there's also, you know, the, the horror movie, the idea of something just sprouting and reverting back to a kind of wild, ugly piece of itself, which when we get in a few minutes to your work dealing with demons in St. Anthony, I think actually, actually there's an interesting connection there. But let's move on because I want the audience to also hear about your culinary things. So uh, just, again, branches coming directly out. Um, again, these are not superimposed. Someone uh, put in the chat that uh, to think about process, you, you can see it here if you look carefully. You can see how the base of the branches comes directly out. Um, again, education, how are we uh, learning about these things and that wild part coming back out. Uh, can we go to the culinary thing? Because I think that would be fun for people to see. So let's let's use a little bit of time if we can. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, okay. I thought we had put it in right after the picnic table. All right, maybe we oh, did. No, it's after, it's okay. after. All right, let's do that and then we can go back. You know, I was really interested. A lot of your work addresses food and people sharing food and eating together. And mm -hmm. of course there's a, you know, Obviously, well, people will see a twist here, but before we show this, could you just talk a couple minutes about where that fits in? Well, um, I've always liked to, to eat. It's like the entry point to that. And also, like, as, an, as my, in my background as an architect, I've always been interested in, like, using my sort of 
practice as an architect to like further and enhance the experience of eating and to elevate that. Um, but also in general, from a perspective of like creating this more of and create it, this creating this, you know, artistic creative experience or environment. I now call them culinary installations, but more or less this idea of sustenance that everyone has to eat and that um, often people let their guard down when they're eating. And, and so with a lot of these like culinary installations I do, uh, the food is just like a vehicle to like expose other like social interactions. So it's, it's, it wouldn't be the same thing without the food, but it's not all about the food and that the food is like a vehicle to allow everything else to work. And that, you know, when you see this video, this is like people are eating a Thanksgiving meal, but it would be hard to create this experience where people are engaged with something, but still in like engaging in the as other aspect of what this piece is about. So the, the food is just, is like a vehicle to allow um, a sort of a, th this, you know, event to transpire. Okay, let's, let's watch it. It's just a minute, but I think everybody would enjoy it. This is a I was wondering whether people are able to get their fork to their mouth, or did you keep it so that was not possible? Yeah, there were, the, it, I, I, there was some practice that it took, but essentially everyone's wrist was diagonally attached to someone else, and between the two of them, um, they had six inches of movement. So <laughs> typically, they, they couldn't both eat at the same time, but they, uh, you know, there was a negotiation between the whole like dining experience where there was a sort of polite dinner table where, you know, I provided all these dress shirts. So everyone was on the same plane, literally, uh, at the table, but below the table, like with the, like the pulleys and the ropes is where there was this chaos. And, and the one thing the video doesn't really capture is the actual experience of, as an adult, someone like pulling on you, like controlling your ability to eat. It's really uncomfortable, but finding like this, like, you know, it's a family style Thanksgiving mo uh, meal. So, you know, everyone eventually had to work together because everyone like comes to this hungry. And also like at any art function, it's, it's always surprising like how fast people will like, like eat free food, which I mean, <laughs> I, I like it, 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 it. So it's sort of like, there's always like, this like drive you don't have to worry about like the participation is going to be there and but you know these people want to eat and they'll find a way to work together to pass the brussels sprouts who's going to cut the turkey who's going to open the bottle of, the wine, of wine so there were uh you know a lot of things that were like went into the planning that you know nothing was by chance but and but how we could sort of you know create this ideal you know uh like very immersive experience. I mean, you're even eating, so it's like, you know, it's sustenance and going into your body. So that eating becomes something where you have to cooperate with the person next to you. So mm -hmm. everyone then has a seat at the table and they have to work together. I, mean, um, I thought that that was, was pretty interesting. Um, in, oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, the, the, and to me, the picnic table is similar because most of the picnic tables, it is possible to actually sit at them and eat. It's, but it's difficult 
to engage with other people. It's not impossible, but there are these like structures that make it challenging to interact. Sort of like, uh, uh, but whether you can say it's this consciousness of the environment having its revenge or, or just these like obstacles or barriers to, to socializing. But it, just like the table had its own built in like complexities to make the experience more difficult. So, so do these uh, tables. Let's go ahead to the facade of the house. There, let's, if we can just skip. I'm sorry, my little dog is whining if you hear. It's okay. Um, I, I want to just take a moment and stop here uh, so that people can see one of the things I really like about this piece is the way you've used mirrors so that what's happening in this one house is reflected ad infinitum down all the different sides. It becomes a kind of, you know, Levitt town of, uh, of these houses. And I was thinking about this, looking at it and your background in architecture. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about what you think you bring with you from architecture in, you know, in, your, in something like this. Oh, well, there's a, I mean, a few different things as an architect. One, obviously, is this idea of, uh, as you mentioned, Levittown and this idea of this like sort of archetypal idea of a house shape um or this like even cape cod style house but essentially like a little cottage house uh with a pitched roof and two like dormer windows but um as well as also just finding a way to build this like effectively and efficiently um with non-traditional materials but also um to create this illusion that there's actually only half of this house that's been built and everything else is an illusion or a fantasy this idea of like a suburban dream you know isn't necessarily real and it's difficult to to occupy or, or, or um, that space um and and so it, like the, it was also this goal of creating what appears to be a street or also like a row of hedges and like also these ideas of like a birds making a nest and then like so then this, uh, in this installation, only three walls, the three walls you can see have mirrors. So it doesn't create a forest or like a plantation, but it, it, only, it only made like a street, like a, like a long row of hedges. But definitely like, you know, my, you know, I'm pretty sure I made a drawings of this in SketchUp one to figure out the sizes. And, you know, I built this entirely in my studio. It, it comes apart into pieces. So you know, it just came in, you know, and handy from a fabrication perspective as well as like also conveying the, the overall gist of the idea, sort of my background as an architect. But a lot of times, you know, it's more apparent here because this is an actual house. Yeah. Um, it's probably embedded in all my work, just some things it's like less apparent. I was thinking about this a little bit um, in my mind. I got a connection to Gordon Matta Clark's splitting and this idea of an architecture, someone else who got that degree in architecture and sort of walked away from it. And the house is something that's supposed to be, you know, secure and safe and predictable. And then this is a little bit more, you know, becomes a little bit uh, a facade of friendliness is actually, you know, not a uh, sort of facade of a kind of innocent Americana or a vernacular, you know, it has that, um, you know, that you've, it, something has been split open and revealed. Um, we just got a question actually from uh, someone I know who is an artist herself who's curious about where you source the wood. Could you just talk a tiny bit about the, the wood salvaging and, and then we'll, we'll go on to uh, end of days. Yeah, I wasn't, oh no, Day's End is the name of, uh, oh, it's the thing of the David Hammond's version of the Gordon Mata Clark thing. It's oh, okay. But then, but then you said end of days. But also, uh, um, Gordon Marta Clark went to Cornell for architecture school. Then he started what became White Columns, which I went to Cornell for architecture school. Then I had a show at White Columns. But, but anyway, these are made from Christmas trees that line the center of Park Avenue uh, um, here in New York. So for me, like. Uh, they have like a pedigree, like, I mean, the, the different trees, I mean, I, like now I'm like, you know, in my opinion, no like, like piece of wood I use is just like a piece of wood. Like 
they like bring to the table whatever like cultural history like if i did get wood at home depot like i got wood at home depot because that actually means something for me in the piece that it's like this type of mass marketed available like just construction grade whatever like that actually enhances the piece it's not because it's not just like a by chance uh so like you know there's a lot of work it takes though to t transform a discarded christmas tree into a house that still has some of the branches on it's not it's definitely not an easy like process to do but um you know in this case yeah they're like these like they're christmas trees that's an element they're from park avenue that's an element but also you know then the physical presence of it you actually most people wouldn't know if it was an apple tree or a christmas tree because they're sort of there are no leaves on it um and, and so like i like that ambiguity of it but also um some of the other woods i use like come from more like you know, charged or challenging areas, or I use them because of like uh, the color of the wood, like whether it's ebony from Africa or from Texas, or if it's a type of mahogany from uh, Honduras, like there are different qualities that come about from the characteristics of the wood coupled with, um, you know, if it was growing in an area where it was considered invasive, like I, I'm interested in those like social like histories that are applied to a piece of wood as well. I think that's really interesting. I know we're going to be running out of time soon. I wonder if I'd like to talk a little bit about the end of days exhibition. So if we could, if you don't mind, if we could just skip ahead a, a couple. Um, and Hugh, if I'm if I'm passing something that you want us to stop on, shout out because I don't want to uh, do that. But. Okay, okay, you know, I love this one. I, I use this one uh, myself in talking about your, uh, our program today. Um, yeah. But let's go to the, the, end of, the end of days. Okay. Was this, was, sorry, was the pulpit part of the end of days exhibition? It was uh, intended to be, but I didn't have enough time. It was envisioned that it would be in that show, but it, as it like an altarpiece because the whole show has like a religious theme and the gallery is kind of to me the shape of a cathedral so this was supposed to be originally it was a reference to like charles white's like black pope painting there's like a like a, if you look closely in the background there's like a pelvis and legs behind that preacher oh. it's the, the whole painting is in brown shades shades of brown so this is like black walnut which is brown and then it but it called black and that it's American. And so, uh, and it's like a soapbox preacher. So this, this was like a, for me, a translation of that artwork, but I didn't, it wasn't actually in the show. It, it was made after the show, but it was, it was intended to be in the show. Okay, let's go to the, I think I have a Saint, we have a Saint Anthony here. Okay. Um, I don't know whether it's, you know, an oversimplification, but I, in, Having looked at a lot of your work, by the time I got here, I felt like the, there was an important key to your work here because this is also about a kind of, you know, an undercurrent of a kind of uh, an evil force that is always there and that kind of pull of the facade versus the kind of hideous flayed demon underneath. And I don't know whether it's an oversimplification to say that somehow that current runs through a lot of your work, but I wondered if you could talk about um, how this kind of connects back to what we've been looking at. Yeah, because yeah, I guess this idea, well, yeah, a skeleton is normally hidden. And, and uh, so yeah, there's definitely that idea of that, but here it's revealed, you know, that we pass by another image of like those three pelvises and different woods and I therefore different colors um can we just go back to those pelvises then for just a quick but, second but uh, but so yeah there definitely was uh this idea of like exposing something that was hidden and that and those other whereas here there's this idea of choice you know you picking to be who you would like to be maybe but um you know that often there's like these like difficult spaces to inhabit, especially with the, and I guess this idea that the skeleton reveals that like 
challenge or that other voice inside. And I, I think it's more though just like a, um, I mean, it's not the same answer for everything, but obviously I'm the same person making everything. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, also like, I mean, these different sort of consciousnesses, you know, happening. But I, I would say that um, to some degree, there's like, I don't know, I just, have, have re re I tend to say recently more that they're just like these difficult spaces to occupy that mm -hmm. often in America, it's like hard to, to have some, you know, on this, the kitchen table that is thorny, you know, it could be seen as someone is like protecting the table from other people, or it, it's like, there's one perspective. So it's like something that's um, kind of on the offense or that like you're the person approaching this table and seen as this like unusable thing that looks dangerous that might hurt you. So even though, the, I mean, there's always like two sides to how it looks like, to the one person who's like protecting this thing, they're also keeping it from themselves even using it, or unless they learn how to occupy these like dangerous spaces. Like, uh, so that, so there, uh, there, yeah, there's always the, these like kind of, there's more than two ways to look at things, but they're not necessarily dangerous. I mean, it's, it's about like knowing how to use it or, or mm -hmm. to inhabit that space. Or just maybe being aware that uh, this double message is there. I mean, I thought, you know, titling this one America, uh, it, it really resonated with me because, you know, so much uh, about this country is this facade of, uh, of innocence. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has really been stripped away, especially in the last few years. And I, I feel like your work uh, finds a very visceral way of revealing that through uh, the familiarity of, again, this kind of American vernacular, this Americana, um, to see it uh, sort of the, the veil taken off, the curtain drawn back. Uh, and that's, that's sort of how I read this. You know, obviously on a personal level too, we've all had family dinners that probably felt, felt bad. <laughs> so there's that also. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's both of those things. Yeah, there's like different scales of, yeah, because someone might look at this more of like, yeah, just like you can't sit at the table with your other family members without it going south. But like, <laughs> like there, there's like, yeah, so there's like, that was like one thing I, thing that I've like have tried to, to consciously do with some of the work is that it, you can approach this from different ways in your relationship with who whatever and like and to ha like how that you might perceive this table that it's not only about the american well i mean the american dream has many aspects to it but it's not only about citizenship it, it's like there, there are many ways of, of like understanding like this idea of coming together yeah yeah finding a seat at the table um should we turn to questions catherine where are we with with time do we have time to take a quick look at the skillets at the end yeah, we definitely have time. And just as a quick reminder, if anyone has any questions, just drop them in the chat for our Q&A. But yes, Julie, we do have time. Okay, well, let's go to the, the skillets just for a, uh, there we go, uh, with the Banks and the Crosbys. Uh, Hugh, were these part of the installation at the Bainbridge Galleries? Not these skillets. These skillets were at uh, Listen Gallery at the uh, show I had in London. Uh, the ones that were in Princeton at the Bainbridge space are look visually a little different. They're made, they're, and they were created a different way, but overall, um, this bot, these cast, this body of work that are these cast iron skillets, uh, essentially they are new skillets I've created that were based off of like merging an African mask with a skillet or pan or pot and then having it recast as one piece in iron. And then I have, uh, once I've received them back, I've seasoned them as you would season a cast iron skillet. So this, the piece, what you're looking at is one, you know, monolithic piece of iron, seasoned cast iron. And in terms of, for me, uh, the idea behind them is that they are, uh, it's more about this idea of the like African cultural origins 
of America uh, and that and that sort of in the idea of cooking as this like met, as a means of creation and that sort of that these uh, skillets per se in this act of cooking become foundational. No, I think, yeah, I think they get, they get the point across uh, really clearly and this idea of entangled histories, right? And um, points of contact, I mean, that they speak of, of points of contact, uh, a kind of, I think we used to talk about hybridity and now it's, it's more complicated than that. It's the, a kind of entangled history that a kind of ghost that, that hovers over uh, our history that we don't ever even think about. Um, yeah, it's, but I like these. It's funny you say ghosts because there's like also like a, it could seem, it was like, would have been easy to call them like soul food, but to me that would be too limiting and like making them more of like saying this is a black experience, but by the show that these were in was called American food and there was this idea that it was actually not just like a African or African American thing, but American, American. thing. I know, ab absolutely. I, I'd say uh, an entangled part of, uh, of our history at, at every level. And this brings it back to a very human level. And just from a formal and process um, perspective, I like that it's all made out of one piece of metal because it reminds me of how you make everything out of one piece of wood. It's actually an incredible uh, capacity to, uh, to use different materials. So um, I think what we can do is uh, maybe end here. People are, are putting up questions in the chat and I'm sure they'd like to ask different questions of you that I've been asking. So maybe we should open it up to that. Yes, um, I think this is a great time to move to the Q&A. Thank you, Julie, for the questions. And thank you, Hugh, for your generosity today. Um, our first question comes from a RAIL team member, uh, Nick. Nick, you should be able to activate Hi. your mic. Uh, thank you, Hugh and Julie, for this really fascinating conversation. Um, Hugh, you were kind of talking about, I was first curious about how you source the wood and you were talking about that a bit, but in noticing some of the types of wood with some of the subject matter, you know, there was, I, I thought it was interesting specifically with the fence piece in the, in the title, there was the specific Latin type of wood. I think it was Virginia redwood or something. And then noticing like with the uh, piece America, it was mesquite wood. I'm curious if there's a conscious or unconscious decision-making process of how you connect the type of wood to the subject matter, if there's an importance. Oh, yeah, there definitely is. I, I guess I've been writing the Latin name less now of the wood, but I, I do always mention the type of wood, typically. Um, but yeah, so like, the, um, like that red cedar came from a around Dallas where I grew up and there was like, that's like a, like a ubiquitous sort of native tree from where I have come from or like where, where I was raised and, bo and ra born and raised. And even um, it's red, it has other qualities in terms of like cedar would often be used as an outdoor wood because of the natural like uh, makeup, the physiognomy or the makeup of the, of the wood is, can be pest and, sort of rot resistant. So that that was qualities why it would be used as like a fence post. Um, the mesquite wood was even more so, well, it, it also had its own uh, re reasoning because uh, specifically it, it was growing in the, in the Southwest of the United States and that some of the wood I used was from the, near the Mexican border in Texas, like of Laredo and, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the town on the other side, but um, but essentially uh, it was it's considered invasive or like a weed in that area because it often um, can thrive in this sort of really arid sort of uh, environment where there's not a lot of water, and that often a lot of uh, ranchers or, or farmers will um, kill it or you know whether they do, will do that will kill all the trees and like a year or two later they can use the land for cattle or something 
because they're concerned about it taking up a lot of water and also like crowding out other plants that they consider more desirable. So even though that's a, this native plant, it, it, beco it becomes considered invasive and unwanted. And so I, I was culturally interested in this idea of a wood and its right to belong. Uh, another wood, which is a wood that occupies that space sort of here in New York where it's not, um, it's native to like the eastern, the east coast, but it's not native to like the northeast. Uh, but it really can thrive in like uh, poor soils. And so if planted in the wild, it can take over a forest and create like a new forest of itself. So it's like, it's actually in New York State, it's, um, you're not allowed to plant a way where it could just spread and not be contained. Yeah, that's so fascinating, the like cultural and ecological echoes these have. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Nick, for that question. Um, our next question comes from Deanna Lee. Deanna, I will um, pass you the mic now. Hello. Thanks so much, Catherine. And um, it's this is a great thing that I'm so glad I'm introduced to his work this way. Um, Hugh, I'm curious if you feel influenced by surrealism to what extent? Um, I, I was thinking specifically about like, there are certain domestic sort of um, motifs that you use that reminded me of like, um, the fur teacup I remember at Oppenheim and the uh, certain images by the painters, um, I think Dorothea Tanning and Remedios Faro. I don't know if, if any of these, you know, uh, um, if you think about any of the kind of lineage of surrealism at all in your work? Uh, I would, I mean, I'm aware of some of those artworks. I always love the fur teacup and I love a lot of Robert Gopher's work, but I, I wouldn't say um, I find myself like uh, thinking most of my works I don't think of in direct relationship to something that's been made. Or I would say though that uh, Red Demon sculpture. Um, I, it was kind of somewhat based on the paintings of Hieronymus Bosch. Although he didn't really painted a skeleton, but it was more the idea of like, what would be the skeleton of one of those figures, those like monsters he's painted. So that was the most, in my opinion, the, and also that Charles, the, the sculpture I said was referencing uh, Charles White painting. Those are, when I more specifically feel like I'm referencing an actual artwork, uh, it has been in those case, but cases, but because also the idea what it was about was in Brussels, and to me, it, it was this context of this religious art history, and and sort of exhibiting it in a space that had this sort of ecclesiastical uh, architecture, in certain terms of like a like a cathedral with like you know a, you know a pitched roof um, on, along an axis, so. Because as an architect, I do in an exhibition, I always try to use this space to my advantage through the class, one small wall, but it was sort of that it would heighten, heighten the experience of the space of the work because of the context of, of the surrounding uh, space. But I wouldn't say I reference typically, like think of like art historically in terms of surrealism, how my work is relating to another specific artwork. Cause I don't come from an art, like an, a traditional art background. I think maybe had I gone to like undergrad and studied art, I might've had more of that, uh, like way of I, I would say I don't. Right. Oh, I was actually, I guess I, I maybe I should have rephrased it in, in the sense that um, I feel like there's a surreal content, like a component to your work, and then that you're using these sort of familiar objects and images or, or, or motifs and sort of recombining them to make them strange and disorienting. And that's what I feel is, is sort of the, the, the influence of surrealism in a more general sense. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Deanna. Our next question comes from Lei or Lee. Sorry if I mis mispronounced your name. Um, I will pass the mic to you now. Hi, Hugh, it's Lee. Um, I was just, hi. Um, I'm just interested in this idea of alchemy and how people talk about alchemy happening in the kitchen, but also around woodworking and thinking about the story of Pinocchio, a little boy made of wood who comes alive. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to this idea. Is that present in your work? Do you ascribe to alchemy in any way as an idea in your work? I, I haven't posed it, because alchemy comes up in different ways in the work. One actually in a more like, uh, some of the woods have reactions to the air or certain materials that happen in a more traditional sense of that. Um, but uh but some of the th i do like uh, actually a lot of people who, who see my work who don't come from like an art world or experience have often said oh gosh you've like breaking you've brought the wood alive and to me that's like a huge compliment when you know in america most the idea of lumber is like this like rectilinear plane or thing that is completely removed from nature where trees are so organic and like, uh, you know, weird shapes. Uh, but, you know, the most common experience of a piece of wood is flat, you know? And so like that, that definitely this idea of like reanimation or like, you know, the way you can also look at some of the works, are they like growing? Are they coming alive? Are they frozen in time? Are they moving? Like, um, to me, it's like a compliment if someone's experience of the piece is if it seems like it's in some state of reanimation or, or, or animation. So I like that idea of alchemy there, but also some of the, some of the ones do react to the, to the air, just like an apple. Um, like if you cut open an apple or a pulpado, it like browns or it oxidizes, most woods, react to the air, they will change color. Because um, that those parts of the tree normally never, you know, are intended to be shown uh, if the tree was alive. And so they, they, they also react. Uh, so there, I haven't played around with those too much. Um, with one of the, some of the wood in the show in London is very, it's called chestnut and it reacts to the weather in different ways into the concrete. Um, even like a piece in my studio right now made of cedar, wherever, whenever it touches the ground, it leaves a mark, which I still don't understand because it's like dried wood and it's, uh, but it's just some, some sort of alchemy that happens. It, it like it leaves a footprint wherever it goes in the studio. Thank you. Um, that was super interesting. Um, so our next question comes from the publisher, Fong. Fong, you should be able to activate your mic now. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Hill. Thank you. Uh, beautiful hat you're wearing. And <laughs> thank you, Julie. Um, I'm learning a lot. So I had two uh, very simple questions. One has to do with how does an image come to the work? Does it come first through a form of drawing? Do you make preparatory study? Or does it really come directly to your mind because you know we know several sculptors who do not make sketches of drawing anticipating to the final work uh, and we do others where they make endless drawing only to prepare for the the image to come to the subconscious so that's my first question my second question is that um, how much does the handmade, the presence of the hand in the work here? In other words, you know, we had Montpellier year recently. We didn't quite welcome Ursula von Weidensbach quite yet, but both work specifically in wood as a material where Ursula is very specific with cedar. She had been invested her whole entire more or less life as a sculpture exploring cedar material where Martin has endlessly explored all kinds of woods. And both of them emphatically, declaratively, always insist on the presence of the hand. They're the one who's gonna make the work. 
whereas others, whether Judd or Richard Serra, the, the mere fact of off the hand or fabrication uh, or some form of related manufacture can be made as long as they're the one who can really monitor it very closely to, to their, you know, expecting results. So that's my question, you know. First, the image, does it come to your hand or come to your mind? And the other is just a matter of how much the presence of the hand in the world. Yeah, um, that's a, a great question. I would say it's, um, I definitely have the idea. I don't just like go in the wood shop and just start cutting. Because also, well, for me, well, I guess obviously some people can like, I am using power tools, you know, uh, but there, there's also some awareness of the material at the same time. So like I do make sketches and I, and like, uh, I have ideas of what I'm going to make, but ultimately, um, th those sketches, I don't always say if something has branches that I don't need to draw the branches on it. Cause yeah. I, cause I know, I know I'm like, in terms of like, there's certain things I do, I do like, I need to know that that's a 23 degree angle. Yeah. Cause I get it up on the table saw. There are some like, uh, there are those sort of more geometrical thing, aspects of the work I have to plan for. But at the same time, what I've liked about working with the sort of these natural materials where the branch might be going different ways that I can also sort of plan for that, or rather than say plan, I can acknowledge that mm -hmm. opportunity for randomness and chance. And so that like, well, uh, that I feel like gives the world this opportunity where it may be hard to tell how it was created, but uh, that, that gives you some of the mystery. But like there's, there is an order to the chaos. So I definitely, I do like, plan things but sometimes a lot of times I have to test out and like especially when I'm like doing the more sculptural organic round forms like I can't really draw that so there's a lot of times something some things you have to just see like we just have to do but I, I definitely I, I a lot of times I I do at least plan them out if there's uh if there's like a precise geometry involved mm -hmm. I wanted to show you all, I was going to try to, I could share my screen to show like a, one of the drawings that I, I made to make um, what was on the screen before the uh, gargoyle or like the red demon because most people might be surprised that there was a, uh, uh, that I made like an AutoCAD drawing for it but is it is it okay if I share my screen really fast uh yeah just one second I think okay, you should be able to now okay um so like because obviously no skeleton exists of a gargoyle so essentially this is uh, this is I don't know what tr version of this this is actually me like tracing like the this these different parts of a body like like in different views mm -hmm. i could like so I, i'm not using that wasn't using a 3d program to do this this was all based on like constructing like different views of bones and ribs and then coupling my understanding of plywood so that i could then abstract you know ribs and also so this like uh, most people you couldn't like I couldn't hand this drawing off to someone and say make this because the missing steps are kind of in my head of like how I'm planning that they connect mm -hmm. to each other. But um, ultimately, I did give a foul to a, a company that made like a CNC cutout in the plywood of how all this went together. But um, you know, like this there. There was um, this was like a the, the space for making that um, 
sculpture, most people would never think that it, you know, it came from something like this. Mm -hmm. But I'm mm -hmm. sort of like trying to imagine, you know, how, like, you know, how, so, how, because uh, it's funny because I also, I don't really ever show drawings. Yeah. Um, and it, it's sort of like, I kind of like how this looks as a thing on its, like, a, on, as like a, but it, it, you know, there was a lot like the, the, the initial sculpture that came out of this looks nothing like, there was like a lot of work that then had to go in to fill the steps. Of, of like of like constructing the piece and sculpting it. Mm -hmm. So that lead to the second question. So you you do both um, allow a certain thing get fabricated and certain thing you will handmade from your own hand. You do both. Yeah, typically I still even if I've had something like fabricated to some degree, I still have to like tweak it. So like the skillets come back from the uh, fabricator. But I, I then I have to go back and um, tweak like because the because the kind of the fabric the foundry I use they're not a fine art foundry so they come back I have to fix the eyes and the mouth there's things I have to touch up and like clean up on um, most of the I don't I haven't I haven't had any work where I it just like came back and could go to the gallery yeah. like there's always like something there's always some like hands on part that where I've had to do like some level of finishing. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for showing that segment which went so fluidly. Um, yeah, terrific, you guys, thank you. Back thank to you, Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really cool to see, a um, little behind the scenes. Um, so we have a tradition at the rail of ending all of our lunch times with a poem. Uh, we've carried these community, this tradition into these community events, and today I'm thrilled to welcome the poet Judah Rubin to the stage. Um, Judah Rubin is the author of Antiquarian Historiography, forthcoming from Oxai Press. Recent poems and translations appear in Senahoy, Elderly, and the anthology Salones de Beleza. He is the, uh, the editor of A Perfect Vacuum and is a doctoral candidate in English at CUNY. Um, Judah, I will hand a mic to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Julie. And of course, thank you, Hugh. That was um, really fantastic. And um, I would agree that you definitely do bring, bring the wood alive. You do animate it. So I was really um, really glad to hear you speak to your to your work. Um, so I'm going to read um, a couple of translations by a Peruvian poet, Rodrigo Quijano, um, a friend of mine, and thinking about him and folks in Peru, which is not in great shape right now, although I suppose very few places are. Um, it's from two different um, projects. One is from a book called Una Procesión Entera Va Por Dentro, and I'll uh, read that first. I'll just read the first um, first poem from that, um, and then and then I'll go on. Um, now imagine that you're a bullet, and you are the protesters who are all fleeing in different directions. Imagine that the bullet is a missile filled with inhabitants who vent their discontent while clearing out space among the veins, and your heart and body are torn completely apart. Imagine that you are the heart that displays as its emblem a brilliant silver bullet, and that the bullet is the old gold of a broken tooth among the crickets chirps at night in the field pursued by the police. There's a camera that speculates, searching for news, knowing that every image can be an accusation if the whole is a scope by which you join the skin to destroy all that you meet in your path, like a child let loose in a room full of vases that explode with their restrained red. Beneath it, the planets rotate with more Saturns than actual miracles, a dawn tossed onto the grass, already a corpse, already unfocused. Two, now imagine that your body explodes from fatigue, pierced by the shooting. Imagine that at the beginning there weren't words, but only the beginning the act itself forms, ferns and the flowers that bend their heads in a hail of bullets that tears into a procession and tattoos the wooden bodies of the faithful where someone has forgotten the golden buckle of the blessed and does not know to yield. 
perhaps because an acrid smell wafts from this puddle with the brightness of a devotee's candelabra, and because today the strawberries are heads on the beaches and the enigmatic fruits that hang from the trees are the dead that you counted last night. Three, it may be on the wind that stopped blowing or the heart that is a diamond, or it may be from its dry glass eye and its thick steel tear. Imagine that we weep together on reading these words. And um, I'll read the first two of these poems called Three Abandoned Poems. I'll abandon the third one, um, but I'll read the first two. Um, you remind me a lot of someone I know well, maybe too well or so I think. Here the days are much longer than necessary, but without snow to dampen the tumult and screams of summer, they make these short and predictable rounds all to the same place. On the point of giving up my one steady job of the last 10 years, but not the grind, and with the varied events of years end, fait divers comme on dit, among them the suicide attempt of a friend who reaped only two broken ribs on the second day of the new century, the sad, effective suicide of a poet friend who set himself on fire in his bedroom, although it was that or an esoteric auto-combustion phenomenon filled with pure, infinite mystery into which I imagine he entered with lucidity and a half smile as he announced it in a poem and new book, and the drowning of another friend's boyfriend who I didn't know and what's more on a beach I've never heard of. There's enough fog, that's true, palpable like lies, but at the same time unreachable, like news that happens before one o'clock, migrating from one point to another on the stage, a curtain run hastily between Chorillos and Magdalena, or between La Herradura and La Punta, Callao, which sometimes shows and sometimes doesn't, like the tip of an iceberg, which is the city of Lima, shipwrecked in its thoughts, as it collides with itself in the darkness and its own invisible shores. Two. 17 presidential candidates from your country, all courting big business, more or less the same and more or less distinct, always reiterative, massive and consensual, and above all, nothing sensual and plenty of cons. Three, plastic trays and palm trees and well-recycled Peruvian plastic beatus, wax saints and pure shootout effigies from the artificial Arc de Triomphe through which we deposit ourselves in the new century with a bang of bienvenida, or maybe, sim or more simply, it's the arrival at the absolutely empty place, like an ATM filled with bits of paper crumpled on the dawn floor, and some fleas left over from a dog that slept here a night or two with his owner, folks lost in a caravan that crossed the canine jungle and leapt at continuing their path through the savannah, or were they only my lawn sheets in which someone jumped? Four, some ceviches queue in front of the malecon, some chameleon ceviches, some accordion ceviches, some ceviches with a camarón queue. It's a cumbia, or at least it should merit the purchased happiness of a new year, but it isn't, and the year isn't new either, and the happiness has been sold out. And thus, many projects, and almost almost the desire to do all of them and to let time pass slowly like summer passes, like an ice cream man who pedals slowly in the middle of his patron's break, après midi of a fan, walking slowly, aimless beneath the trees and listening to the music of any day at three in the afternoon and the intense heat of any day at three in the afternoon. It's the second of these abandoned poems. Not the waves, but the sensation, the sea leaves on retreating from the beaches, and not the beaches, but the rocks that one steps on entering the sea, revealing the anemones held as a fixed idea and numerous cultivated stones like images of fossilized organity, like the pumice stone or an asterisk in 3D, gaps and marks are the idea of seeing signs everywhere, but trapped in the schizoid semiology, even if somehow, anyhow, geology is something that one can read. The analogy remains suggested by the Chinese Chinese tradition that the origin of writing is the invention of a Chinese official who had observed a river, that which he had examined with such thoroughness were the rocks that, surprising as it may seem, are called cants. Two, they circulate in trilobite spines in the armored crustacean and are only mock-ups of small labyrinths of an emperor fascinated by the vision of a brain like an old bonsai from the heights, all made of a material from far before humanity. Everything is the test of whether we once weren't here, although the result is the proof that we will one day belong there. 
The stone is the sign that dissolves the impassable frontier between geology and ourselves, striated from above and below. And maybe because of that, at 56 years old, the poet Martina Dan asserted that human and rock, we are one. And he said, all is alluvian. Three, if you see the landscape, forget it, as the analogy is, in the end, incomplete. Fins, scales, mock-ups of terraces seen from a plane or trim topiaries in the parks belong solely to geology, always and when they rest now, empty on the seabed. Thanks a lot. Wow, thank you so much, Judah. That was really amazing. Um, and thank you, Julie, and thank you, Hugh, um, so much for this wonderful conversation. Uh, we host these every day. Um, tomorrow, please join us for a conversation titled The Near Future of the Public Art Museum, which will be a conversation with art critics and writers Amanda Fortini, Amandi Abby Hintz, and Seth Rodney, um, with Rail Consulting Editor Joaquin Pissarro and Rail Board Member Helen Lee. Um, you should all be able to activate your mics and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you again. and. As Mary Riley just put it in the, the chat, happy 100 for our new social environment. And thank you. Happy 100. Yeah. Happy that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Judah. 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 <laughs> Beautiful read. Thank you, Julie. Thank, thank you, Judah. Nice to see you all. Good Thanks. to see you again, oh, Jeffrey. You. Thanks for coming. Nice to see you. Thanks so much. Hey, Thank Sally. you. I'm that was fantastic. Working on. When are you going to show us? <laughs>